Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our Easter Sunday morning service. Uh, happy Easter to you all. And uh, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, for us to gather together. If, uh, if you're visiting family, friends, uh, or if you've come uh, from the village and this is your first time, a special welcome to you as we uh, gather together. Um, during our service, there will be a creche and a children's group for those in primary school. So diggers and explorers will be having a joint get-together upstairs. The two classes are coming together. Uh, there will be refreshments after the service, uh, so do please stay around. And um, just to note, there won't be an afternoon meeting uh, this afternoon. During the week, our community groups will be gathering, uh, so do please go along to those. If you're not in a community group and would like to be, please come and have a chat to myself. I'm John, uh, or Will, here to, to my right. And next Sunday, uh, we have our bring and share uh, lunch after the church meeting in, in the morning. So um, do put that in your diaries. It's a great opportunity for us to stay a bit longer, enjoy one another's company. Well, as we start this Easter Sunday morning service, I'm going to say the words in white, and we will say together uh, the, the words in yellow. This is a verse from Matthew 28, verse 5. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that Jesus rose just as he said. And we rejoice, Lord God, this morning in our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you that his resurrection shows that, Lord God, our Father, you are satisfied with the payment that he had paid for our sins. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for your great salvation. And on, in, on this Easter Sunday morning, we pray, may we all know joy in our hearts as we trust in the risen Saviour. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. We're going to now sing two songs, Rejoicing in the Resurrection of Christ, our Saviour. See what a morning, followed by Glory to Jesus. Please stand as the music leads us.
Please be seated. It's uh, great to have so many folk visiting us today. So if you've just arrived, just want to extend our welcome to you uh, this morning. Um, Will's now going to come and give our all age talk. Thanks, Will. Good morning, everyone. My name is Will. If I've not met you before, I'm one of the leaders of the church uh, with John. And it's a very happy Easter to you, a very warm welcome. Now, we're going to take, for the break, for regulars, we're going to take a break from our, our little series we're doing in the All Age Talk to think a little bit more about um, Easter. And to do so, we're going to ask the question, uh, why do you look for? Okay, so help, uh, work with me. Just imagine uh, with me <coughs> that I am looking for an emperor penguin. Don't shout it, okay? Don't shout it where you might find it. But I, let's say I am looking for an emperor penguin. Now, imagine... If I got on a plane, I paid lots of money, and got on a plane and went to the Sahara Desert looking for an emperor penguin, what would you say to me? Hands up. Who I would, I mean, yeah, keep it light, but <laughs> <laughs> keep it broadcastable. Uh, what might you say to me if I was looking for an emperor penguin in the Sahara Desert in Africa? Yes. Is that a hand? What might you say? They live in the Antarctic. They're, I've got a picture. Yeah, they live in the. They don't live in the Sahara Desert. They live in the Antarctic and Antarctica, right down where it's really, really, really cold. 
And yes, you can take them to zoos and that kind of thing, but that's where they love to live. They don't live in the Sahara Desert. They live in Antarctica. You might say, why do you look for an emperor penguin in the Sahara Desert? Because that's, that's completely wrong. Okay, let's try something else. Let's say uh, I went home uh, this afternoon and uh, was looking for my dinner. I get a text from Vicky saying, kind of, come on, it's, it's um, time to go home now. Uh, and uh, why? And I'm looking for my dinner. Now, imagine if I walked into the kitchen, man, I walked into the kitchen, and I went over to the kitchen bin looking for my dinner. What might you say to me? Okay, again. <laughs> Where would you expect to find your, your dinner? I hope. Yes, at the back. On the table, exactly. You'd expect to find your dinner on a plate on the table. You wouldn't look, hopefully you won't go looking for it in the kitchen bin. You might say, why do you look for your dinner in the kitchen bin? One more. Let's say uh, tomorrow morning you uh, got up and you uh, wanted to get dressed and you were looking for a T-shirt. It may not be yellow, but just imagine you're looking for a T-shirt. Now imagine that you went looking for a T-shirt in the laundry basket where everything's really smelly, everything's really dirty, all oh, there's football kit in there, there's things you were you know, running around a field making mud in. What might your mummy or your daddy or the person you live with say if you went looking for a nice clean T-shirt in the laundry basket? Students, if you can't for the moment. Um, Olivia? Why are you looking there? Where would you look, Olivia? In the cupboard. In the cupboard, in the wardrobe, in the drawer. You wouldn't look for a nice clean T-shirt in the laundry basket, would you? That would be silly. Now, on Easter Sunday morning, two of Jesus' friends got up very, very early and went to the tomb where the soldiers, where the Roman soldiers, uh, working with the Jewish leaders, had laid Jesus' Uh, body. They went there and they found the tomb, as we read, opened the tomb. The, the stone had been rolled away. It would have been this huge tomb. There'd have been a Roman seal on it. The Roman guards were out, would have been outside it previously. No getting in. Now, what did they expect to find there? What did the women expect to find there? Anyone want to guess? Emily. Jesus. Dead or alive, Emily? Dead. They were expecting to go to a tomb. On one level, they were in a tomb. They were, did go to a tomb. They were expecting to find in the tomb the dead body of Jesus. They saw him be killed on Good Friday, on, East, on, on Friday, two days before. And they expect to go early one morning to find the tomb of Jesus. But Luke 24, we'll all try and say the words in bold. Um, don't worry if you can't read, just listen in. Listen for this question. In their fright, so the women are met with angels. That's not normal. The tomb stone has been rolled away. They go inside, and there are two angels. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men, that's the angels, said to them together, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Do you see? They go looking for a dead body in a tomb. And the angels, very kindly but gently but firmly, say, why are you looking here? That's like looking for an emperor penguin in the Sahara or a dinner in the bin. You're looking in the wrong place because Jesus isn't dead. <laughs> He's alive. And, of course, Jesus had told them again and again that he would die and on the third day he would rise. Jesus is not here. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Don't you see? Jesus is alive. And 2,000 years on, every Sunday, Christians gather to remember the news that the angels were told that Jesus is no longer among the dead. Jesus is alive. This morning, boys and girls, you'll be thinking about that upstairs. Uh, adults will be, oh, everyone else will be thinking about it uh, down here. It's world-changing, life-changing news. Jesus is not among the dead. Jesus is alive. And we celebrate that today. Let me pray.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus is no longer among the dead. We thank you that it was an inappropriate place for the women to go, to look for Jesus, because he was alive, just as he said. And so we pray in our hearts, Father, that you would help us to rejoice this morning, to be really happy, even though there are things that make us sad, to be really happy that Jesus is alive, just as he said, that he rose and that he reigns for us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Will. Well, we're now going to uh, stand and sing our next song, celebrating the vastness and greatness of God's love that we discover in the Easter message. Let us stand and sing, and then after this song, the youngsters, primary school age and below, will go upstairs to their classes. Let's stand and sing.
seated and the youngsters are now going to go upstairs. <clears throat> and as the youngsters go upstairs, upstairs we are now going to come to pray together. Let's pray. Saviour of sinners, divine Redeemer, we come to praise and worship you this morning. How blessed we are for this happy Easter morning as we celebrate your glorious resurrection, Lord Jesus. As we reflect, Lord God, on the vastness of your love to us in Christ, we are humbled, Lord God, that you have brought us to discover a love that is beyond this time. Lord God, we thank you so much for your divine love, for your grace in sending your only Son to be our Saviour. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in consenting to be made sin for us, in conquering all our enemies. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your strength in enduring the extremities of your Father's wrath to take away the load of our sins. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your glorious love that is and has saved people from all nationalities and backgrounds. We rejoice this morning, Lord God, in your mercy. Thank you for Jesus who ascended from heaven, but has now descended from heaven, but now has ascended to your right hand. We praise you that he is the crowned champion of heaven, enthroned and there interceding for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you intercede for us in all our struggles still with sin. And we thank you that one day you will receive us finally to yourself. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your wisdom in the gospel of our Saviour. We thank you for the glories of your grace to us. And as we bathe in your love and your mercy, we are so thankful. We thank you for the rich encouragement, for the multi-dimensional blessings of the resurrection. We are so glad to be united to you, Jesus, and to be reconciled to you, our Heavenly Father. We are so glad to be knit to you for all eternity to discover our rest in you, to discover our peace that Christ has brought, to be able this morning to behold something of your glory and to honour you together in this meeting. We want to thank you, our God and Father, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he is our teacher, our guide, and the one who has helped us to repent of our sins. And so we thank you for your glorious salvation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our hearts are drawn to you this morning in thankfulness and praise. Well, God, we come before you and repent of 
the words that we have said that have grieved you, the deeds that we have done that have displeased you, those seen and unseen, for sins we have repeatedly committed, for sins that we aren't even aware of. We pray, Lord God, for your forgiveness. We give ourselves again to you, Lord God, and we pray that you would help us to live our lives as an expression, a symphony of praise to you, the God who has pursued us, who's drawn us, and who's embraced us. We want to thank you, Lord God, for the encouragements that we've been seeing recently of those coming to faith in Christ. We thank you for those uh, that we've heard of from our mission partners around the world where people are discovering new life in Jesus. We thank you for gospel victories that we hear of all, o- all around the world. And we pray, Lord God, that in uh, the following weeks and months we may see and hear of many more advances for the Christian faith in a world that is hostile and has always been to Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord God, that you are powerfully saving people from all backgrounds. Lord God, we want to pray this morning uh, for the Latvian Biblical Centre in Latvia, where John has been instrumental in leading that work, in setting that work up, and for its ongoing Uh, ministry there in Latvia. We pray this morning uh, that the work, gospel work in Latvia would flourish and we pray Lord God that there would be uh, many encouragements in the remainder of this year. Particularly we pray that a new director would be found and we ask Lord God for your encouragement there. We pray, Lord God, for the work of the Christians that are out there in Latvia amongst the homeless. Thank you for the message that John was able to share with them, uh, with that group of homeless people on his last visit. And we pray, Lord God, that the love of Christ, as is seen at the cross and the resurrection, would bring hope to those people in life and in death. We pray, Lord God, for the ongoing translation work of John's book, God in the House. And we pray that that this book in Latvia would be instrumental in strengthening those who preach and teach the Bible. And that it would be um, used by you, Lord God, for your praise. We turn our hearts, Lord God, to Cyprus now. And we pray for James and Rachel Swanson, our mission partners there. And we want to pray on this Easter morning, especially for their work in the prisons. Thank you for uh, the Bible studies that James has been doing with some of the prisoners. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity Rachel had to visit one lady in prison regularly. And now as she has uh, left prison, we pray, Lord God, for ongoing opportunity to share the gospel with her. We pray, Lord God, that there would be uh, those amongst this group of people who shall discover hope in Christ uh, uh, and the glorious grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to to those who are bankrupt spiritually. And now coming back to home, Lord God, we want to pray that you would be with David Turner. We pray that you would encourage him, Lord God, uh, after a week in hospital We ask, Lord God, that you have your hand upon him. We pray for one another, Lord God, in all the joys and the sorrows of our lives, that you would uh, grant us your grace and your encouragement. Help us, Lord God, we pray, as we meet as community groups. And may these be times of strengthening as we support one another in our walk to the heavenly Jerusalem. And now, Lord God, as we come to your word, we pray that you would help Will preach it 
Uh, as it's read to us, we pray, Lord God, that you would shine your light into our hearts, that the entrance of your words would bring light to each of us, Lord God, we pray today. And we pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified in our lives as we live in the light of the resurrection of Jesus, in whose name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, Vasso is now going to come and read um, two passages of scripture, and then Will will preach. Thank you. Right. Um, We have two readings. The first one is John 20, and it's on page 1089 in your church Bibles. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here 
See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The second reading is Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and it's on page 1182 on your, in your church Bibles. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, <coughs> whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. Let's pray again as we come uh, to God's word. Let's pray. Because you have seen me, you have believed, Jesus told Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Father in heaven, we are those who have not yet seen the risen Lord Jesus this morning. And yet thank you, Father, that we are blessed despite not having seen him, to believe in him. We thank you for the eyewitness evidence in our hands and in our ears. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to say with Mary, we have seen the Lord. And by faith to trust in him this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for some reason, um, Easter weekend reminds me of lockdown and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's something, in many ways, we're kind of wiping gradually from our memories. Four years ago now, it was, uh, we were kind of locked down at home um, uh, by ourselves, and that was a hard time. I, I guess, like many people, I um, listen to lots more music than I would do normally. And one of the songs that uh, we found ourselves listening to as a family was one by a guy called Andrew Peterson. And it starts with the line, do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the world is broken? We all feel a sense of the brokenness of this world, don't we? I don't know if you saw in the news this week, uh, but in Baltimore, a ship was going along the main river through uh, Baltimore and lost uh, propulsion. They managed to get the engine going again, but they wouldn't, couldn't get the kind of propulsion system in the ship, in the big kind of tanker ship, cargo ship, uh, going again. And it ploughed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge. There were six workers still on the bridge. The, they'd stopped the, uh, the traffic going through, but there were six construction workers on the bridge. And on Tuesday, they gave up the search for their bodies in the river, which is freezing cold. And, of course, therefore, there are six families in Baltimore who are not having a very happy Easter. You don't have to go far across the world, of course, to find tragic stories of brokenness. You don't have to go far in our own country. But, of course, you don't have to go far in our lives either. 
There will be things in each of our experiences that will be deeply painful for us. There may be things to do with other people that we know and love who are going through a really hard time and we feel that sense of, of helplessness. It may be to do with ourselves, whether it be physical health, might be something to do with mental health, or something in our experience, and we feel the brokenness of this world and of our hearts. We feel that sense, this, this aching sense that things are not as they should be. It might be an issue of injustice. You've been badly treated at home or at, or at work or somewhere else. It should not be like this, is the ache of our hearts, isn't it? We all feel, whatever we think about Jesus this morning, that the world is broken. The song goes, do you feel the world is broken? And the answer that everyone with the choral choir goes, we do. Now, our secular culture, you know, predominantly those who are in power at the moment, they don't kind of put it blunt, as bluntly as this often, but essentially that's a, they kind of go with the, kind of the Disney version. Kind of, well, that's all, folks. You know, that's, that's it. There's, okay, there's nothing really more we can say. We don't kind of are consistent. We're not consistent with this as a culture in so many ways. But un- underneath the kind of bravado, essentially our secular culture goes, well, this is all there is. You know, we're just atoms that are bouncing around in a particularly collected way. It's all random. There is therefore no logically no meaning, though none of us ever act as if there is no meaning. But there is no meaning. You die, and then that's it. Of course, the world, you know, we try to make the world a better place. Yes, we're in lots of ways we're more technologically sophisticated. But morally, there are more slaves in the Western world now than there were during the slave trade of the 18th century. It's a shocking statistic, and actually most of them are sex slaves. We like to think as a culture that we have made progress, and yet we are just as broken in different ways sometimes than every other culture down in human history from anywhere around the world. And our secular culture can be described as kind of Protestant pagan, Pagan in the sense that it has this sense of, well, there is no meaning to to the world. There is, you know, it's just you live and you reproduce and then you die. But deeply, profoundly Protestant in our ethics. You know, love one another. Where do they get that from? We're deeply Protestant. Our culture longed for there to be an ethic, a, a, a love of neighbor. Our secular culture, therefore, deeply feels this question that the world is broken but has actually no answer to the question of what do you mean by broken? (laughs) Because this world is all there is. It is striking, isn't it, that whether Christian or not this morning, whether Christian or not in in this village and in mid-Sussex, we all ache for a world that none of us have ever experienced. Isn't that striking? We feel the world is broken. Now, we all have different responses to that. People have different responses, don't they? We can deny it. No, it's not true. And come up with some kind of evolutionary idea to, that gives us morality. It doesn't work, of course. Just look at um, Matthew Paris's article in the Times, for example, uh, yesterday morning, I think it was, arguing for euthanasia. It's logical. If you, you know, don't be a, this life is all there is. You have no meaning. He says it basically pretty explicitly. So don't be a burden on others, just kill yourself, that'll be better. He's being logical. We can deny it, the brokenness, and go that way. We can distract ourselves. We are more distracted, aren't we, as a culture than almost any other culture, because we've got this thing in our pockets that any moment we have a down moment, out comes the phone, and we don't, as the Bible says, we don't stop to think. We can downplay it, again, like so many. We downplay the kind of existential angst. But when we look at it, and look at this world in the way it actually is, we look at our hearts and our lives, and we look at the brokenness and look at it in high definition, we admit that it's there. It can be devastating, can't it? 
and we're left dejected. It's one of the reasons I love being a Christian on Easter Sunday. Because the Bible explains why I feel that and gives me an answer. The Bible says, let me tell you, as it were, a better story than the kind of pagan culture of what does. Our Bible tells us that there is a good God who made everyone and everything. Not many gods. There is one God who is creator over everything and therefore made you and made me and made everything we have a good God over a good world. He made this world perfect. When he made this world, it was not broken. It was an amazing place to be all the time. <laughs> Nothing ever went wrong. Ships didn't plow into bridges. A good God made a good world. Which is why we ache for it, because there's a sense in which in an echo of our human experience, we somehow remember it. God made humanity, Adam and Eve, best of humanity, put us in this world to look after it, to rule over it underneath him. That's how the world is meant to work. Us knowing God, us looking after the world. But mankind rebels. Read that in Genesis 3. We said, God, we think we can run the world better than you. We think we know better than you. And we rebelled against him. And because God is so good, he put us, as it were, outside of the Garden of Eden outside of the place of blessing, under his just and right curse. And the Bible says because of the link between humanity and the world, brokenness came into the world and into our experience. Humanity was broken. The relationships between men and women are broken. The war of the sexes started. Men and women started to hurt each other. Men and and men and women and women started to argue and fight and Genesis 4, kill. Our experience, our relational experience was broken. And of course, because we sin, because we rebel against God, just as God said, we die. Why do we die? Because we all, by nature, sinners. We are those who rejected God. It's why death feels wrong. You ever stood at the side of a graveside? No one ever says, well, logically, you know, they don't exist, just atoms. There's a deep pain there that our culture can't explain. This explains why. Death is an intrusion into our world. It is God's judgment on our rebellion against him. But because we have rejected God and hurt each other, brokenness came into the world. The world, as it were, was cursed. Which is why the world feels like it, in the Romans 8 analogy, feels like it's, it's groaning, it's creaking, it's broken. Good yet broken. just explains the world as the way it is, isn't it? You're going to go up on a, an amazing mountainside and think, this is amazing. And then you fall over and stub your toe. Goodness tainted with curse. And the Bible, therefore, says, in our human experience, we live outside of Eden, longing for a perfect world. We have echoes of it in our collective memory. We have echoes of it in our hearts. We feel the world is broken. We feel deep darkness at times. And left to ourselves just in this world, there is no hope for us. Do you feel that? Do you see how it makes sense of the world? But we're still left with this sense of brokenness. And ultimately, before a holy God, a sense of no hope of being, as it were, back in relationship with him. There is a sense in which things are worse than we might have imagined. And so come with me early one morning to a tomb. John chapter 20, have it open in front of you, um, if you can. I imagine many, most of us are familiar with the story, but Jesus on Good Friday has been uh, betrayed, well, Thursday, Friday, been betrayed, denied, mocked, beaten, whipped, tortured, crucified, and therefore he died 
on Good Friday mid-afternoon. He was murdered and he was buried. And in the experience of his followers that afternoon and on that middle Saturday and as they went to bed on that Saturday night, it must have been, they must have been pictures of brokenness, mustn't they? All their hopes, all their dreams for this Messiah, this Christ figure who would come and make everything right again. All the hopes and the dreams from the Old Testament promised and prophesied. They thought that was going to be Jesus. And their hope, their light in the darkness, has been killed by the darkness. This was going to be the one to fix the brokenness. And now things just feel worse. Chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, what does she think has happened? You see an insight into her heart. What does she think has happened? Well, verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter, one of the other apostles, uh, disciples of Jesus, close friends, and the other disciple, that's John, the one Jesus loved, he just drops it in there, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. What does she think has happened? Someone has nicked the body. Peter and John leg it to the tomb. John records that he won the race. He gets to do that because he wrote the gospel there. Uh, he ran the race. They leg it to the tomb. They find it empty. They find lots of carefully folded linen. There's kind of a part of linen for the body of Jesus, a kind of a linen, separate linen part, carefully folded for the head. By the way, if you're going to nick a body, you don't take all the linen off first and carefully fold it. It's not the kind of thing you do. Come back to that in a minute, maybe. So verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Just picture her. She must have been a picture of brokenness. You ever seen someone just kind of lose it? Just a picture of desolation. Maybe you felt that yourself. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb again. And saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head, and the other at the foot. Now I wonder what you would expect the angels to ask her. <laughs> well, what they ask her is verse 13. They asked her, woman, which is not a derogatory thing, it's such a term of address. Why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. She wants to honour his, his body. She wants to maybe help to prepare him. His, you know, do all the uh, spices and that kind of thing. It was a rush job on the Friday. You can hear the pain, the grief, the brokenness layering up in her heart and her experience. At this, verse 14, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked the woman, again, just turn of address, why are you crying? Same question. Who is it that you're looking for? Now, Jesus knows the answer. He's drawing her out. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. She's not clocked this. Jesus said to her, Mary. He said her name the way a friend says your name. You know, you recognize it. There's a, different, there's a tone to that. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. You get the sense that Mary has told John that very directly what she said. <coughs> Thus he records it. Now, let me ask you a question. What is it that Mary is looking at? As she turns, what is she seeing? Well, she sees the person, but what do we mean by that? Well, the Bible's very clear. Jesus wasn't a kind of zombie, a kind of undead, kind of resurrected version in a kind of just been, I don't know, they got the defibrillator out or something. No, 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 the Bible says he really died. You don't survive a Roman execution. When a Roman centurion says you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> Yeah? It's not a zombie. 
It's not a resurrect. It's not a revived person. Nor is it as just Jesus' old body resurrected. Staggeringly, the Bible says that as she turns and sees Jesus, she sees the person of Jesus with a renewed body, a new body, a new kind of body. You see it in the rest of the chapter. Um, Thomas comes and says, Look, I want to I feel the nails, you know, the whole, I want to feel the hole marks, I want to feel the hole in the side. And he gets to do that. There is a similarity about Jesus' old body and his new body. He's recognisable in some way. Maybe he doesn't quite clock that. Maybe it was the tears that made her head made her, you know, fuzzy. We don't know. But he's recognisably Jesus. He's a real man. He's not an angel in that sense. He's still a man. There's similarity. He looked like a Middle Eastern man. There is similarity. There are wounds. And yet, the Bible says, this is a different kind of body. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, talking about the, kind of the old body and the new body, the body that we lay into the ground is, that sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. This new body that Jesus had has, is imperishable. It is glorious. And it is powerful. It is, as Paul says, a spiritual body as opposed to a natural body. He's still human. He's still similar. But he's different. It's a new body. I don't know uh, how you watch uh, films or TV programs these days. I tend to, we tend to spend, uh, as a family, half an hour choosing something to watch, and then you, you've lost half the time of wanting to watch. And as you go on to Netflix or Prime Video or whatever, what you do, you think, oh, you scroll down the various options, you go, yes, yes, no, maybe. And then if you think you're going to watch something, you watch a trailer, which is kind of a 90-second version of it. Now, what is in the trailer? What is in the trailer is what is a bit of what is actually in the film. Yeah? It's not something completely different. What is in the trailer is what is actually in the film. It's not all of it. It's a preview. It's a trailer. It is a taster of the film. And you say, yes, please, click, or no way, and you click to something else, and you keep scrolling. What is it that Mary is looking at, therefore? Well, she's looking at her Savior and at the Lord. We're going to come back to that. She's looking at the person of Jesus. But here we're, here's where it's mind-blowing. The Bible says she is, she is looking at a trailer of something. A trailer of the new creation. Let's go back to our little slide for a moment. Again, the Bible says God has made the world and that we are broken and that the world is broken and left to ourselves, that is how it is going to be. The Bible says that in Jesus' first coming, when he first came, in his death and resurrection, he died on the cross to pay for our sin, to deal with that root problem. The root of all the problems that we have in this world is our sin against God. That is what Jesus was doing on the cross. He died on the cross, taking the punishment in our place for our sin, so that we can be friends with God. He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven. But the Bible says one day Jesus will return to this world. He is going to come again. And when Jesus comes, the Bible says Jesus is going to restore this world. Don't believe people who say Christians will spend eternity kind of in heaven eating Philadelphia. It's kind of this ethereal experience. We may eat Philadelphia, I don't know. But it's this world washed clean. It's this world renewed. It's this world made perfect and even, even better again. It's, we don't just go back to Eden. We go to a better Eden. Where, as it were, we're, we're put in this, God's people will be put in this world and we will enjoy this world as we were always made to. Ships won't plough into bridges in this world. Renewed. And Jesus, as it were, is going to come and put this world through his divine washing machine. And it will be made perfect again. Christians don't believe that we die and we just go to this ethereal experience, that we escape the physical. 
Christianity is profoundly earthly. It cares about this world. And we look forward to a new creation, this world renewed. And that is what Jesus is going to do when he returns. The world we all want, the world we ache for now, that's what's coming. As C.S. Lewis once said, if I find myself desire, in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. That another world is this world renewed when Jesus returns. Jesus is also going to raise everyone from the dead, the Bible says. It's extraordinary. But everyone who has ever lived will be raised to life. All those who have not trusted in Jesus, not repented of their sins and followed Jesus, will be under his judgment, his just judgment, as we were praying. But all those who have trusted in Jesus, will be raised to life, will have these perfect bodies, these perfect minds, which just work perfectly. And our bodies actually will be like Jesus's. Glorious, powerful, honourable, imperishable, forever. We will have bodies like Jesus's. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, um, in uh, Colossians 1, sorry, that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. It's a weird illustration, but he describes, as it were, as, as, as the tomb, as like a, a mother giving birth. <laughs> Jesus is the first one to come out of the tomb, the firstborn from among the dead. The firstborn logically follows that other people will come. It is the power of Jesus that makes a tomb a womb. We will, as it were, be raised from death. His people will be, in this world, renewed perfectly with bodies like Jesus. It's the world we all want. As Mary looks at Jesus, she sees the first part of the new creation standing right in front of her. The trailer, the taster, the foretaste. This glorious saviour. She's looking at the living proof that there is life after death. She's looking at the living proof that judgment is coming, that Paul says in Acts 17, that the proof that Jesus will judge the world is that he, raised, he was raised from the dead. Uh, at the back, uh, there are some little booklets. Uh, do take one, um, particularly if you're not yet a Christian. Uh, is, G is Easter unbelievable? Four questions that everyone should ask about the Easter story. Is Jesus' life historical? Is his death ethical? Is Jesus' resurrection credible? Is Jesus' offer desirable? Take that on us. But it shakes out. It really happened. Paul says, you need to work out whether you think Jesus rose from the dead. Because if Jesus did, when you die without Jesus, you will face judgment. Mary is looking at the living proof that Jesus can be trusted to keep his word. She's looking at the living proof that Jesus is able to save, ultimately, from suffering, sin, and death. She is living proof. She is looking at living proof that her creator, who knows her and who she has rebelled against, loves her. Mary doesn't get all this. Verse 18. She just goes to the others and declares, I have seen the Lord. She gets the headline, he's alive. <laughs> but it is not for nothing that Easter morning, the original Easter morning, has been called the greatest day in history. Because it is, as it were, the rubber stamp, the banner put over the world saying, do you feel the world is broken? If you do, there is hope. That humanity cannot fix itself. That humanity cannot fix the world, however much we try in our pride. But that Jesus can, has, and will. If you're not yet a Christian here this morning, can I ask you a question? Do you want this to be true? 
do you want there to be a restoration of yourself in our brokenness? A restoration of this world in its brokenness? If I can put it in a punchy way, the alternatives to that narrative, the narrative of Christianity, the alternatives don't make sense if you interrogate them for long enough. They fall down logically and experientially. Our culture says this world is broken because it's because of its Christian background, but it has no reason to say, to even use the word broken. <coughs> Atheism says, well, ultimately there's no meaning. Agnosticism says there's no certainty. Other world religions says there's no assurance before God that this world is going to be fixed for you. Jesus, as it were, stands outside the empty tomb and says, Mary, humanity, it's true. You were made for another world. You are broken. You were made to know and love me. And Christ, as it were, comes out of the tomb in our minds, as it were, this morning. He stands here. He stands over this world saying, come to me. You need a savior. You can't raise yourself from death to life. You can't forgive your own sin, however much our culture says that you can. You can't sort yourself out in this world. I can, I have, and I will. Repent of your sin. Don't stop living for yourself. Turn, believe in me, and live. John finishes that chapter, doesn't he, by saying, these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That life is pregnant with meaning, that word there. It isn't just talking about eternal life after the death through the grave to the resurrection life, though it is. It's eternal life that starts now. Just as the new humanity of Christ has started now, so there's a sense in which the Christian is a resurrected person spiritually. Knowing God loves you now is the assurance that Jesus gives to everyone who trusts in him. Knowing a certainty in an uncertain world, peace in a world that seeks to shatter it in our hearts. That is the offer of the Christ to you. And if you're a Christian here this morning, well, as the Apostle says, if it's not true, we are to be pitied <coughs> amongst all, above all other people. Basically, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christians are the most pathetic people. Doesn't mince the word. If it's not true, then like the rest of the world, we are facing certainty of death with all the uncertainty that comes with that. But it's true. And therefore, in the brokenness, look up again to your re resurrected, risen Savior, who loves you more than you could possibly ask or imagine, who died and rose for you, that you having been, as it were, killed in Christ, your sin was taken, and your, as it were, your spiritual life been raised from the dead, guaranteeing your future resurrection. He did all that for you. He will return for you one day, just as Jesus stood outside the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come out. There is a sense in which Jesus will stand over your grave and say, your name, come out. A deeply personal thing. Jesus will make your womb, your tomb, your womb too, in that sense. Jesus will make your tomb a womb. And in life now, Jesus walks with you through the dark valley of life, in the brokenness of this world, whispering to you by his spirit that this is temporary, that one day it's all going to be okay. I don't know what you're going to face this week, this term. That thing that makes you flinch, the hair stuck on the back of your head. You think, I don't know how this is going to work. <coughs> I don't know how I can keep going. There is a sense in which Jesus whispers to us, I am with you, I love you. This is temporary. The clock is ticking on the new creation. It's coming. He walks with us. Sometimes people say that the people who have, our, have their kind of heads in the future in, in heaven are no earthly, no earthly use. History actually proves that to the opposite. The most useful people in this world, those who love others, are actually those who heads, whose head are in the future. 
we live for him now, we love our neighbour now. And with Mary this morning, by faith we can say, we have seen the Lord. We haven't seen him physically yet, one day we will. But by faith, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. By faith this morning we gather, as Christians have done every Sunday since the start of the church, since the resurrection of Jesus, gather in their brokenness to rejoice (coughs) that we have seen the Lord and that one day he will make all things new. In the brokenness of our hearts, in the brokenness of our lives, with the things that we face We have faced, we face and we will face the deep darkness. There is deep hope. We have seen the Lord by faith. And as you see me now, we will all one day see the risen, resurrected, reigning, ruling Lord Jesus. Who stands over this world now saying, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest for your souls. I was going to read this, but I think I've actually got the clip. If you want to sing along, uh, it's fine. We'll uh, just stay seated. It's a two-minute clip of this song, or at least the first 90 seconds, and then we will stand and sing a different song. Uh, Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, we got that bit. (laughs) Um, Thank you, Andrew. There's a little refrain at the end of each line. If you want to sing along, do. If you don't don't know, that's fine. Could someone drop the lights at the back? (coughs) Lee, could you run? Thank you. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting Father, we feel the world is broken. We feel that in our hearts, in our lives, in our experiences. And we feel it with the rest of our world. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that with Mary we can say, we have seen the Lord. We thank you that Lord Je- the Lord Jesus walked out of his tomb that Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago in glory and in might. We thank you that he ascended to heaven where he rules and reigns and one day he will return to make this world new, to make his people new, to judge the living and the dead. And we pray, Father, that by faith, therefore, we would see the Lord again this morning and rejoice in the very depths of our being, in the very depths of our brokenness, that he is alive, 
that he reigns, that he rules, and he will return. Help us, Father, to believe in every sense of that word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing, uh, reflecting on some of those things.
please be seated. Just to remind you uh, that we have refreshments afterwards. If you're visiting us this morning, it's been great to have you with us. Do please stay around. We'd love to say hello and uh, get to know you a little bit. Um, do please take one of these. Is Easter unbelievable? If you haven't trusted in Christ, if you haven't discovered the amazing love of God that's demonstrated at the cross and the victory that we see at, uh, at, on Easter morning at the resurrection, do please take one of these. They're on the back there, uh, free for everyone. And uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> 